But tonight we're going to be in the book of Jude. Um, and uh, I want to preach to you on a topic called a Christian response to historical heresies. A Christian response to historical heresies. I feel like as I have done research um, and I have been a part of church since a child and I have grown up in church and I have had the privilege of being at other churches across the country, um, both of my uh, grandfathers were pastors. My dad is an ordained minister. I have had the blessing opportunity to preach. Um, I grew up in a Christian family. But I would say that throughout my travels in the United States, throughout my research, uh, throughout my time with, I've, been, I've spent time in other denominations, with other churches doing research among them. I spent some time during COVID with uh, the Greek Orthodox in Pensacola, um, seeing their response to COVID and church lockdowns and things like that. Uh, and uh, I would say that the number one problem facing Christianity today, churches, is not persecution. The number one problem facing churches today is not the world. It's not politics. It's from within the church. As we'll find out as we go through, and my plan is, uh, time and Lord willing, that we'll go through the whole book of Jude. It's only 25 verses. But I want to show you that heresy is nothing new. False doctrines is nothing new. As a matter of fact, we find out in Jude that false doctrine has been occurring since the book of Genesis. But I feel like in America we have been lulled into a false sense of security because we enjoy hearing devotional style messages. And that's good because we should devote our life to Christ. But there's more in this book that teaches us and anchors us to our faith that I oftentimes am scared that Christians are not reading to learn, they're reading to live. And that's good, and you should live. But doctrines are essential to our faith. Doctrines and being anchored to the doctrines of Scripture and knowing what the Bible says will prevent you from departing from the faith or being sucked into something else. Back in the 1830s, when the United States was young. This is right off the tailcoats of um, the two great awakenings and other different revivals throughout the United States that had been happening at that time. Uh, there was a young man named Joseph Smith uh, who had received a new revelation from God. And, and uh, obviously, if you know anything about history, you know him as the founder of Mormonism. Mormonism got its start in Baptist and Methodist churches because he was a touring pastor. Joseph Smith was a touring pastor. He had his copies of the Book of Mormon. He would preach and say, we're not doing what's right. God wants us to do better. And if you want to follow God, I'll sell you some books after the service. I got some books that I want you to read. And because Methodist and Baptist churches were not grounded in the doctrines of Scripture, they bought the books and they became his first converts to Mormonism. Now Mormonism is a global faith with millions and millions and millions and millions of followers and they will do their dead level best to try to convince you that they are Christians and they are not. <clears throat> because according to the book of Jude, Christians are those that support the divinity of Christ. Support that God is both divine and human. The Mormons don't believe that. So then what does Jude say? Let's start off with reading a little bit uh, in Jude here, and we'll get into why it's important to be grounded in Scripture. Verse number 1, Jude 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you, and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jude, uh, who 
is, yes, he's the servant of Jesus, but interestingly enough, he's also Jesus' earthly brother. Um, Jude is not an apostle, and he does not claim to be. Uh, he was not one of the twelve, um, and he's the brother of James, the author of the book of James. Um, from all of uh, my research and being able to tell, uh, the book of James was written about A.D. 60 to A.D. 65, so keep in mind this is only 30 years after Christ's resurrection. The church is in infancy. The church is new. The church has just seen Christ go back to heaven. Same generation in many cases. And Jude is saying, I was going to write to you about the common salvation that we share. And if you're saved in here, we have common salvation. He said, but it was needful for me to write unto you that there are men among you that have crept in unaware. Uh, for time, we won't go here, but if you're interested, uh, Jude seems to be clarifying on what Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 2 uh, about these false prophets. And so if you go and you read back through Jude and then you uh, spend some time and read through 2 Peter chapter 2, you're going to find out that, oh, you see a lot of crossover. You see that they're talking about the same things. And uh, from everything that we can tell, we can't really tell what these heresies were. We can't tell what these false doctrines were. Uh, but suffice it to say that the false doctrines of AD 60 are the same false doctrines that are out there today. The same heresies that are susceptible to uh, drawing in new converts to Christianity or uh, drawing people away from the faith are the same heresies that we see. They're just repackaged. They're repackaged and they're repurposed. Um, we know that this is an early time because uh, Jude is writing to a small group of Jewish converts, and we see here in, uh, in the book of Jude that they're still worshiping in synagogues, and there's actually no set term for the Lord's Supper or communion. As a matter of fact, in this book, it's called Feasts of Charity, and it's nowhere else found in Scripture called Feasts of Charity. Uh, and so um, this is an early time, and, and Jude is writing that it's necessary for Christians to contend for the faith. Contend means to fight. Contend means to be combative. Now, you don't have to be combative to the lost, but you need to be combative in here. And combativeness requires you to be a thinker. Combativeness requires you to be a reader. Combativeness requires you to be a doer. Because you can't do without hearing they're interlinked. So it's needful for Christians to be attentive to the proliferation and dissemination of heresies and heretics that are all throughout both Christian history and all throughout our churches here today. Have you ever driven across America? Have you ever looked at seeing how many churches have closed? Who's got, who's got the larger congregations? It's telling. This epistle serves as a stern warning for what 2 Peter calls damnable heretics and heresies. And it's an announcement for Christian believers to stand up. And it's an encouragement for the church that there's nothing new under the sun, to quote Solomon. Now, the difference between uh, um, Catholics and uh, Orthodox oftentimes use the term heretic. But I would, I would beg to say that it's something that is still applicable to Baptists. There's a difference between a heretic and apostate. A heretic is one who's within the church espousing to false doctrines or teaching false doctrines, whereas an apostate is like Demas. When Paul says, uh, Demas hath forsaken me and loved this present world. Those that leave the church and never come back, those aren't heretics. Sure, you could say whatever you want. They're an apostate. Heretics are a special breed of folks who come in, and they are the main threat to Christianity. So therefore, it is the church's responsibility to contend for the faith. As a matter of fact, many of the New Testament epistles, let me quote some for you, Galatians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, 1 John, James, 2 Peter, and Jude, and parts of Revelation all deal with false doctrines. If so much of the New Testament is spent 
talking about doctrines and warning against false ones, it's time for Christians to start diving into Scripture and knowing what is taught. So let's discuss a little bit um, about these uh, false teachers. Let's go, to, uh, let's go back to verse 4 here. For certain men crept in unawares who were before old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness or fleshliness, and denying the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will put you in remembrance, though, that ye once knew how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them, not, um, destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, set forth an example, the suffering and vengeance of eternal fire. So the first thing that we see is that there's a lineage of these historical heresies that have crept into American churches, have crept into churches from time and memoriam. The first is that they're compared to uh, um, the unrighteous Egyptians in Exodus, particularly in the way that they were set within their ways and the status quo. They weren't willing to change. And because, you know, we think of Pharaoh hardening his heart every time uh, a plague would come, God punished them. God punished them. The second thing that we see here, and uh, we were introduced to it in verse 6, was that uh, these, uh, this uh, lineage of heresies is within the lineage of the angels that regarded not their first estate. Well, who are these? These are the fallen angels. Um, now, the interesting thing is, is um, the Bible talks very little about fallen angels. So, very little. So, some of what Jude is talking about has to do with Jewish understanding of fallen angels. Um, and uh, we see, though, that within the text, that um, they regarded not their first estate, but left their habitation. We know that Satan fell because of the sin of pride. But in Genesis chapter 6, we see that the fallen angels were active and causing humanity to sin and stumble. Jude is comparing here that these false teachers that are out there who are trying to come to churches and trying to find headway into people's hearts and minds are in the same lineage of fallen angels. They're out to seek people to get them to stumble. <clears throat> Bible says that they're reserved in everlasting chains and darkness unto the judgment of the great day. This is apparently a very specific type of of fallen angels, uh, because obviously, you know, in the, in the ministry of Christ, there were those that were possessing people. This particular group uh, are currently chained. Uh, we see, um, lastly, uh, that the lineage of these historical heresies uh, lies within the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, which, uh, besides uh, going after strange flesh, as it states here, are set forth in as an example of what? the pinnacle of my own way in rebellion. We see a lot of people who are deciding to practice their own version of Christianity, a new type of Christianity. Uh, well, no one's ever taught this before. Be careful if you hear somebody on the radio or on TV or in your Sunday school class who said, no one's ever heard this before. I'd be, I'd be a little nervous. The next thing we see is that there's a rhetoric of these historical heretics. Let's, let's go on. Verse 8. Likewise, also filthy dreamers, they defile the flesh, they despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, uh, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of things that they know not, but what they know naturally is brute beasts and those things that they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, uh, for they have gone the way of Cain. So the thing is that uh, these, the, the rhetoric of these teachers is that they speak evil of domains and dignities. And this is in reference to holy and dedicated Christian leadership. They're there to drive a wedge. 
People who are seeking to drive wedges in churches are false teachers. And oftentimes, they're self-seeking. You know, everybody can start their own church. Um, I, was, uh, I have a friend of mine who is, uh, who is who's a cohort of mine. She's uh, from Morocco, and she grew up Muslim. Uh, and in the Muslim world, you just don't, if you're upset with somebody in the congregation, you don't just go and start your own mosque. You know that? The, the idea of just leaving a church and going and starting somewhere because you can get a congregation is a American Christianity thing. American Christians have not learned how to work out their problems with each other. And false teachers know how to whittle that. And they know how to pry at it. And they know how to split churches down the middle. So they speak evil of dignities. There's a new thing called deconstructive Christianity. And it's a slippery slope. All these people are talking about how, you know, they grew up and and, and they heard all this abusive stuff in the church and all this abuse going on in the church. So they're deconstructing their faith. So they're leaving the church and they're kind of kind of rereading the Bible with a new lens and kind of rethinking it and retooling the Bible for new purposes and things like that. And it's a slippery slope. So be conscientious if you hear things like that. And then second is that they speak of things that they know nothing of. Uh, these heretics speak of things that they know nothing of. For, uh, for uh, sake of time, I'm going to keep moving. Um, these historical doctrines of heresies are found uh, in verse 11. So the, the, what are their doctrines? What do they teach? Woe unto them, for they are gone the way of Cain. They run greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perish in the gainsaying of Korah or, or Korah. The Bible says that they are similar to Cain in Genesis 4, 1 through 8, offering a sacrifice that God was unpleased with. Um, then we see that they're going after the doctrine of Balaam from Numbers 22. You can go and look all this up, which is perverting God's promises for self-gain. That's such a problem. Uh, in Uganda, where I just came from, that the country next to them, Rwanda, is now requiring that pastors have degrees, years and years of education, which many, by the way, many uh, indigenous pastors that live in villages do not have access to that education, but they're shutting down churches because everybody's starting a church and they're asking for money and they're asking for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for people. Why? Because they're Their false doctrines are for their own gain. And then lastly, the gainsaying of Korah uh, in Numbers 16, 1 through 4. uh, Korah comes to Moses and says, you take too much on by yourself. We're all holy here. So why do we have you as a leader? And why do we have Aaron? And then obviously, if you know uh, the book of Numbers, you know that Korah's final end Uh, is destruction, but the reality is is that we have many people teaching Sunday school classes across the United States, and many people who are invited in uh, as speakers who are telling you, oh, anybody could do this. We're all holy here, and they're driving wedges in Sunday school classes, and they're driving wedges in churches, uh, and that is their doctrine. And then we see that there's a impact on their unchecked heresy. Just by way, we're not going to read through. Uh, we find out that there are feasts, there are spots on your feast of charity. They're taking the Lord's Supper. I think it's a travesty that in many churches across the United States, the Lord's Supper is not as special of a moment as it should be. There are many churches in the world where if they don't know you, you don't take it. <clears throat> baptisms, you know, things like that. They, these people come into the church and they're among you. They sit in your, your, your pew. Uh, Jude says that they're clouds without water. What does that mean? Well, there's the hope deferred. If you're in desperate need of rain and you see clouds, you would hope that there is water in them. He also says that these teachers have rotten roots and fruits. Uh, if you look at verse 12, it says... Uh, 
Trees whose fruits withered without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. They got rotten doctrinal roots. They're going to produce rotten spiritual fruits. The Bible says by their fruits you will know them. And oftentimes we use that as a good thing, right? Like, oh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're righteous and you, know, you, you strive after the things of God, then you'll produce good fruit. And that is true. But if you have rotten roots, you'll have rotten fruits. We see that there are waves of shame in verse 13, foaming out their own shame. And then lastly, they're wandering stars who shipwreck sailors. New converts come in and they're excited and they get snatched away. Then there's a charge given uh, in verses 17 through 25. Like I said, I'm running out of time, so uh, I'll just kind of walk you through some things here. Um, so what is the charge given then? If, if this is the case, if false teachers are out there, what is your responsibility? What are we to do? Uh, in verse 17, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own lust, these who separate themselves sensual, not having the spirit. The first thing that you should remember is the scriptures, the things that have been told. You have been told this. Now you know. If you didn't know before, now you do. You have to be in the Bible to know doctrines, and you have to be reading for them, and you have to study the Bible. The next thing we see is in verse 20. The next response is in verse 20. But beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. It requires building yourselves up in the faith. It requires Christian community. Those who are spiritually mature should be teaching those that are not. If there are new people who come join the church or they just get saved, they come in and they're baptized. It is your responsibility to help teach them. But you cannot teach them if you do not know scripture. That is the way that the church works. That we could all sit at home and watch on live stream. What is the point of Christian community then? It's to build each other up, to build the faith. Well, we see as well that we are the ones who are supposed to be instructing new converts as well. And then lastly, uh, uh, not lastly, but uh, in verse 21, we see keeping ourselves in the love of God. John 15, 10, Christ says, if you, love, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide my love. So it requires keeping his commandments. In verse 22 and 23, we see another thing that we're supposed to be doing. And some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Oftentimes we misinterpret this verse. But this verse is telling us that there should be a role of compassion and confrontation in handling false teachers and those that have been led astray. Who is, and of some, referring to, if not to who he's been talking to in the about in the previous verses? We go to the false teachers, those who are sowing dissemination and discord, uh, wedges within the church, and we show them compassion by sharing the truth. And sometimes that compassion brings what uh, Jude says, a difference, uh, which in the Greek can also mean distinction. It makes a distinction. And others save with fear. This is not a home in heaven when they die, but saving them from their false teachings and saving others from false teachings. And then uh, lastly here, uh, we have um, keeping our eyes on the one who presents as faultless is important to preventing against false doctrines. Not the pastors, not teachers, preachers, expositors, authors, radio broadcasts. Those are all good things. But if your eyes are on them and not on the one uh, who can present us faultless in verse 24 and prevent us from falling, then our eyes are on the wrong target. Amen. Hebrews 12 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So lastly, 
and in closing here, uh, some concluding points. So we've seen the heresies, we've seen that there requires a response, uh, and so now what are we supposed to do about it? The command to defend the faith is a congregational command and not a pastoral command. Oftentimes, churches will rely on the pastor to you know, serve as the bulwark against false doctrine. But the reality is, is that the prevention of false doctrine occurs within the pew. That when you hear something and it doesn't match with God's word, you say, no, that's not what we believe here. That's not what I believe. Second, contending for the faith and rooting out false doctrine requires congregants to be aware of two key principles. One of them is that contending and rooting requires knowledge of doctrines and teachings of the Bible through consistent and dutiful exposure to its teachings. Second Timothy 3.16, which is a wonderful verse on the inspiration of Scripture, states, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And we know a lot of it, but we don't realize that that next word is profitable for what? For doctrine. For reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness. But doctrine is the first one mentioned. Scripture should be more than just a history lesson or a little moral lesson. These are things and doctrines that anchor our faith and our religion. Contending and rooting requires Christians to be active and critical thinkers to teachings, ideas, broadcasts, YouTube videos, other preachers. When we hear things, we ought to be actively, critically thinking. And then lastly, uh, given the historical continuation of heresies among God's people, contending requires a lifetime of commitment to God's word. The major thing that we ought to be concerned about within this lifetime is number one, pleasing God, and number two, ensuring the continuation of the church. It's by the preaching of God's word that people can hear the gospel and be saved. It's by the preaching and, and activity of the members that the community is reached and affected. And we ought to occupy till Christ comes, but we cannot occupy properly when we are not inundated with God's word and we know it and are capable of defending our churches against false doctrines that oftentimes creep in, as Jude says, unawares. So let us dedicate ourselves to God and let us dedicate ourselves to his word by doing so. Let's pray.